I'm talking about um, to, to like just the main mill and kiln part of the project. Um, we did the office and stables, the demolition of the south silo that uh, we were involved with over the last uh, couple of years or so, but uh, the big one now is the main mill and kiln project. Um, there's obviously wider things on the site as well, which um, are part of the, the bigger plan, but we're just focusing on that. The HLF funded part of the project, which is the, uh, the big thing, which is, you know, we got uh, the funding confirmed from the HLF in January, um, one of the uh, biggest HLF grants ever, over 20 million. It's a very big project in our terms as well, and uh, that's what we're taking forward now. What it's about, as you know, is the, the main mill and the kiln, the main mill being uh, the uh, area for the friends, uh, on the visitor centre, education, activity, cafe, space, and so on. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the kiln, which is going to be uh, the whole shell of it repaired, and that becomes then the, the hub for um, the office. Uh, going to be uh, uh, lifts going in there and the main circulation. But the ground floor of it, um, retained as part of the friends, uh, visitor space uh, are now being uh, shown to the public as well. And then up above in the main mill, four floors of uh, offices for rent to uh, try to get those uh, back <coughs> into use again. Um, that's uh, we're obviously, as you know, working on this with the whole team of architects, um, uh, FCB, uh, Field and Clay Bradley, who've been working on this site for many years now. You'll be familiar with, with uh, a lot of the, uh, the more broader stuff on the project, so I'm using some of the same slides from that, but just to give you an overview, so that's as you know, one of the major things that happens is that um, we're reopening the windows. Um, the windows uh, were designed in from the beginning, 1797, uh, with the main mall, uh, the main flax mill to get the maximum light in for all of the uh, the spinning uh, heckling processes and so on. Um, were blocked up in 1897 when the building became a maltings, uh, and they needed uh, dark, uh, well, uh, closely ventilated, humid conditions. And in order to give the building its third age, as we often talk about in the project, um, we need to have those windows back again so that we can uh, make it work. So one of the major things that's going to be being done is that. Um, just to talk about sorry, it's a little bit uh, faint, the, uh, the wider site area. As part of the project, as well as the main mill and kiln, the HLF project deals with um, car parking, which is necessary to bring the, um, the main mill uh, to the offices, but also the visitor site parking back into, uh, and some of the other landscaping work around uh, that defined area. There's other, other plans uh, still uh, developing for the uh, wider parts of the site. Um, very quickly, the, so those are the, uh, the floor plans of the, uh, the, the main mill. <coughs> Ground floor, we'll look at that again in a minute because that's your area. But up above there, there is, a, as you know, a huge amount of space in this building, and uh, we, it's going to uh, be quite a demand, which all of us just, well, just uh, rolls really, uh, to, to then uh, be looking at the commercial success of that space in due course once that does uh, come on stream at the end of the, uh, the building side of the project and to uh, get it busy and active with tenants. This is the, um, the ground floor. Uh, of the main mill. So just to explain, uh, this is, you'll probably be quite familiar with this, uh, I presume because this has been developed over um, some years together with the friends and the steering group and so on, but um, the whole of the uh, ground floor is, uh, uh, becomes uh, visitor space, education, activity and so on. Um, at either end, <coughs> there are then uh, service floors with the, uh, the loos uh, and stairs, circulation and so on. This end is the, uh, the lift. Uh, there's access going from the car park into this end for the kiln, and then stair, uh, the little lifts coming up to the upper floors. Um, the, your visitors will be coming in from the, this end of the site, office and stables where we are now, coming into here. Um, there's then a uh, kitchen uh, and so on, sort of provided in the south engine house, loose and uh, a, a, a cafe, the reception counter and cafe, and then a lot of uh, space uh, for activity, interpretation, and exhibition. Uh, so, that's not uh, There we go. Yeah, so that's the, the visuals which were produced uh, uh, some time back in discussion with friends uh, with um, uh, Headland, the consultants, just sort of uh, looking at um, and this is all part of the bid that went into the HF uh, last year. Quite well, worked up in some detail, all of that now needs to be uh, returned to with the detail design because what we've done is we've split the, the, uh, the, um, the project up into uh, two phases. At the moment, 
phase that has started just now is looking at the, the main sort of most important structural works. So I'll be talking mainly about those um, and the later fit out and all of this interpretation and creating the office spaces and so on follows on uh, later on in phase two. That's the, uh, the kiln with this uh, extraordinary great uh, pyramid roof and uh, a new um, lift structure going right up the middle so that that becomes the hub of the building again. Um, and uh, we're actually inside retaining quite a lot of the, uh, the, the space very much as it is so that the existing furnaces and so on will be kept and be part of the, the friends areas to show to, uh, to visitors um, as they are. So that's just, I presume you're sort of fairly familiar with that broader uh, uh, components of, of the wine project. What I really wanted to just um, talk about tonight was a little bit more about what we're doing now in this current contract. So the contract has started uh, um, a couple of weeks ago um, with uh, Croft uh, Building and Conservation after a long process obviously of um, design, specification, tendering, selection and so on. Um, they are, as you'll probably know, the contractors who uh, did the first phase of work on, on this building. Uh, they came through very strongly in terms of the quality and uh, the, the money side of their tender bid, so they've been awarded the, the contract for this next phase. It's five and a half million pounds, it's a lot, lot bigger than this one was, and it runs for 18 months. Um, and what it's about really is uh, the main brick structure of the walls, which I'll be talking about quite a bit here, where we have some major problems to sort out. Creating the window openings, but not actually putting the windows in yet. Uh, doing the, um, the central part of the main mill roof so that we have a functioning roof and, praise the Lord, taking down the scaffolding which uh, <laughs> has <laughs> been here since 2007 and costing us an arm and a leg and gets in the way of everything that you want to do about this building. This is the reason really why we decided we had to split this project into two parts because looking at it as well, it was, it, we've got a very complex, a really highly technical conservation project to do of the, the, the really demanding complexity of the structural repairs that we're doing for which we needed one type of conservation contractor and after that we've got something like a 15 million pound contract which is going to be major parts of it, some repair as well but actually a lot of fit out the, the services, uh, the m and &E workers, we've got it, mechanical and electrical side of things uh, which are all sorts of other components for which we need a lot bigger uh, contractor to deliver that um, to, uh, to the right sort of uh, level that's needed. So that's why we've split it and it's actually now quite a long programme. So we've got 18 months uh, with Croft, uh, there's a, a month break, if we manage it, uh, buffer, and then starting another 24 month contract with the, the whole of that uh, at fit out. So um, quite a long way to go. So it finishes up in March 2021 with the, uh, the finished. But back to what we're doing now, as you know, the, uh, the cast iron frame, 1797, uh, amazing piece of engineering for its time and everything else, uh, groundbreaking uh, and so on, but it has had um, severe uh, structural problems uh, from the beginning. Um, and uh, it's some of those that we're having to address. Um, as you know, uh, it's uh, it suffered quite early on in its life, it seems, uh, some... Uh, Cracking where um, the, uh, uh, there's been some uh, settling of the outer heavier brick walls, uh, the lighter loaded columns in the middle didn't, and the building sort of went like this. And cast iron, being what it is, a brittle material, it fractured. Um, as you probably also know, those of you at least who've been around for some time, there's been a lot of different uh, uh, structural engineering approaches to this, and there was a major project. Uh, that was started with the HLF several years ago, which then uh, had a very different concept of how to uh, deal with the, uh, the structural problems, uh, and uh, it ended up uh, in grave difficulty um, running into those complexities and going uh, uh, a lot over budget, a lot of delay, and too much complexity, and that approach really had to stop. We had to then regroup. We had to look at it again with the design team, and especially with our own Historic England uh, conservation engineering team, and we took a, a rather different approach to the whole issue of structure starting. We're saying that we weren't going to make this try and work this as a standard office building with standard office floor loads. We were going to have to treat this as a precious old historic building that we would have to manage the floor loads as you do in most actual Georgian buildings that are offices all around the country. 
So we've come up with a, with a new design, which means that um, we're introducing uh, six new extra columns on the ground floor to provide the vital support. The, the, the problem gets smaller as the uh, load increases towards the ground. We're then introducing <coughs> a spanning structure within, um, uh, partly within the depth of the, of the first floor uh, with some extra steel. And then we're on the first floor, we're having to put some extra columns in just on the central row. Above that, we're not then having to intervene with columns and beams anymore. But what we're having to do, there's been quite a lot of very sort of complex and clever work in terms of trying to get the most out of the building. So the other major thing that we're doing is pushing tie rods across at every floor, and those are then being rooted into the walls. Um, unlike the tie rods that you'll see here, we've got the opportunity of burying these within the walls rather than having plates on the outside. So you'll see them inside, but you won't see them outside. Um, and um, we're also doing quite a lot of clever stuff with um, putting a high performance uh, screed onto the, the floor, tying up uh, the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the cast iron beams uh, with stirrups and uh, some uh, shear uh, uh, rods to the tops of them and so on. So getting a whole sort of strength and diaphragm action, uh, getting these to work as plates and hold the whole building together. Um, and there's uh, some serious engineering calculation and then, you know it really is it's interesting that the building was obviously leading edge in structure at its time this is very much leading edge in terms of um, uh, where it's at with conservation engineering um, we've had some of the best uh, brains in the country on this and finally come up with this uh, solution Will it be obvious what the new stuff is and what the old stuff is? Um, yes, yeah, so the, the, showing the, people around yeah, so here's, here's, here's the point. So this is the ground floor where you'll be. So the, the main sort of new intervention you'll see, there's the stuff that you're used to. There'll be six of these, <laughs> um, which are like that, um, just round hollow section steel going uh, right through and then supporting the steel work above. Um, and actually what you don't get on this floor, um, because we've got new steels happening on the floor on the floor level above, you don't need the tie rods. So that's actually the only intervention you see is, is six new. <coughs> new um, columns. There's been a lot of argument, as you may know, about uh, the, the idea of introducing uh, additional columns, but that's been the, the, uh, the solution that we've whittled it down to, really. Um, but uh, that's it. And they are set, as you can see, at specific points of load, but they are sort of on the half-bay distance between the, uh, the, the current columns, but not every one of them uh, we have to do. Maybe they be painted red or something. That's, um, that's well, the final decision about the camouflage, you see here, they sort of picked out from yeah. grey. Um, that sort of thing is something still yet, you know, it's a little way down the road. So they need to be, um, as everything needs to be, decorated and so on. Whether we really want to differentiate them strongly or whether we want them to, I mean, they'll look, they, you know, don't show so strongly here, but when you're there, these are unmistakably those darker columns that we, we know and love, you know. Um, so I'm not sure that it needs a, a different colour, really. Probably not. <coughs> Are the maltings columns staying in place? Hmm? Are the maltings columns staying in place? Yes, all of, so we're, we're keeping where we can, you know, the general principle, you know, as with the uh, approach to conservation really, is that we keep the work of, you know, every significant sort of part of the history, which includes the maltings where we can, as, as you know, we're having to lose a lot of the maltings uh, blocking up to the windows because we need windows back but we're keeping the maltings windows we're keeping the maltings columns there you know that means that where there were those enormous water tanks we have a very strong part of the structure where we don't <laughs> additional columns because we can use those and they they're you know far stronger than we need in that particular part of the building but no we, we're keeping those there's um there's one of them which we are potentially we're wondering about whether we need to move the one that sort of gets in the way of the doorway, but mm. that's a, one of the details to which we'll need to return with the detailed design. Mm. But There's jagged the edge bits of girder as well, will they be tidied up or left? So what we're doing, this is now getting into the details, so it's Sorry. already got, but anyway, um, but ju just very quickly, uh, what we're keen to do is where, where you've got at the moment the sort of openings into the structure and you can see because it's all been hacked out you can see the shape of the cast iron you know the, belly, the fish bellies um, cast iron beams and everything we're wanting to leave on the ground floor as much as we can of that on show including rather the, the jagged hole of where the, the, the die house was and we're just looking to put the, the new floor platform above it Rather than, you know, the alternative would have been to cut all of that out and to put back a jack brick arch, which, you know, actually might have looked more kind of, you know, all of a piece, 
but would mean that we were sort of covering up a phase, and in particular would mean that for the technical interest, that's, as you know, with doing the tours, that bit is your one bit where you can say, and here you can see the structure, so we want to retain that on the show where we can. Yeah. Can I just ask that the brickwork's not lined there, is that an interim stage, or will, is, is that thermally adequate as it is? Um, we've, we're, we're keeping on the, in, on the, in the main mill walls, yeah. uh, yes. we're, we're not introducing insulation okay, no, for, for that reason, because we are, we are doing it in the engine houses, in the meeting rooms, but we've had quite a lot of discussion about this. You know, we could we could insulate the walls, mm. but you would then lose completely the character. Oh, of the absolutely. Right. Right. So we've you know in building regulation terms, that means you have to then have a whole plan for saying why you're not insulating your building, okay. which we've been through and we have both regulation and consent and so on. But no, we, it's one of those buildings where you know you don't want to blend out the walls. So the walls all you know mm. look as they do now, you know, sort of uh, okay. a paint finish on the brickwork. Um, now, this is just to get into a little bit more detail because uh, probably the sort of intricacies of, of what happens with the, the brick uh, and the embedded timber is something that you probably some of you are aware about, but it is actually what's driven in particular this first phase of work. So, as you may know, um, we have a problem in this great iron frame building that actually, along with the iron, they actually built in timber. And what has become apparent, and this is something we've only really realised fully in the last couple of years, has been that this isn't just bits of timber lintels over former window openings. This is actually a continuous ring beam of timber, joints in it, all the way down the walls, headed into the wall, and that, and tied in in a rather intricate way to um, the. Uh, so you've got this uh, major timber plate which is going down there, and tied into um, to the. Uh, the the, the cast iron cross bits, part of the original way it was designed to work. Unfortunately, what's happened is that over the years that timber has rotted, um, it's got damp and rotted out, and we've then got a major problem in that we've then got the transfer of the, uh, the, the loading from that brickwork. Instead of having a, a wall this thick, um, say at you know, second floor level, um, <clears throat> you've got this much timber in the middle and you've only got bricks on, on either side. So this is one of the worst things here, but you've then got this um, failure with um, the bits bulging out, um, and that's why we've got this whole scaffold here, why it's not just a normal scaffold, but actually it's a tying scaffold that holds the building together, and why within all the floors of the mill, as you know, you've got those uh, scaffold uh, restraints across, because it's having to um, stop the mill. These are the uh, uh, pressure uh, side of that scaffold side that's stopping that wall falling out and the whole thing collapsing. Like a pack of um, So this probably isn't very legible on this at all. No, that won't work anywhere. It's a bit um, the issue then being that we've got to do do that complex work of getting at that timber while we've got this scaffold which is stopping the building. So there's been a whole uh, trial repair program which we did last year with Croft developing uh, intricate methodology of working out how to uh, fix the building and without it falling down in the meantime. And what that means is we're having to construct a, uh, a giant set of sort of propping and needling, which uh, you may have seen it's sort of buried within the scaffolding. We have one frame of that in place from the trial repairs. We did a whole bay to uh, assess and, and we worked up the methodology of how that was going to be done with Croft. And um, uh, it was not straightforward at all. We've now come up with a solution, which we went out to tender with, and uh, we're now on sort of good firm ground with that. Um, what it means is that this is sort of looking at the external face of the building. We're building up a whole um, prop frame of the sort of jumbo Meccano set of great big pieces of steel work. Um, and then with that, you get then needles coming through the wall to hold the wall up uh, while we take out all the decayed uh, timber and, uh, and debonded brickwork and put it back again. Um, you're the timber the timber? We're, no, we're not. No, we're putting we're putting the timber back with, with brickwork um, to be. Okay. Yeah, we're not. We we don't. That's one one thing that we're not doing. Is putting timber back in. Uh, we we decided that that uh, has not not uh, it's caused so much problems really, and it's hidden within the fabric of the wall. So we need to make it sound really. Oh, sorry, we're expanding the windows. Is that a lintel, some sort of steel, or is it still just? Um, so we well, over the lintel uh, for the for the new lintels of, of the, the interior oh, lintels. We we then there's a brick arch on the outside. Yes, yes. Inside we're actually using standard or uh, special uh, pre-stressed concrete lintels. Yeah, again rather than timber. Um, and they, <coughs> that 
that's a sort of conscious decision to use a modern material which you know is really going to perform it's something that in many cases you know most cases in historical work we wouldn't be doing that but in this case this is exceptional well there's an argument for that as well of course <laughs> absolutely yeah. so we're having to put up this giant propping system which then has needles cut through the wall um, and in order to do that we're then having to do an enormous amount of work alongside that to make that happen um, once you've then got these needles through the wall, and this is the bit that's sort of rather hard to see what's going on behind the scaffold, and it's now going to be happening for many months. This is then an opening up, and what you'll see here, that's the end of one of the, um, the cast iron uh, beams there. That is a rod that comes up into what was a, uh, a timber ring beam. And um, we'll look at that from this one, to see if a little bit more clearly. This is during the Rari Fest. So what we've got here is, that big mark there is, is the, uh, the bottom bearing plate of the cast iron coming into um, in through, through what you're looking at it from the outside face here. Sitting on a timber bearing pad as they often did, and those are often decayed, but actually that's relatively simple. That's just taking a little pad out of timber and putting a concrete pad back. What we then got is this very strange moment. This is the timber ring beam, or what's left of it up here. Uh, this, this is this vertical iron rod that connects right down in here. This is a sort of blocking piece that's threaded onto that so that it gets up to this level for things to continue across the heads of the windows. Um, and the problem is that all of that area has become debonded. Got this uh, um, uh, problem with uh, decayed timber in the middle of it, and uh, the brickwork is, uh, is, is all going up. And that is the highest stress piece of the building. You've got these piers that are only about this wide and you've got a whole section in the middle of those um, <laughs> with point legs coming onto it, uh, which is in this sort of state. Um, so, um, so there's a sequence, as you've seen, we've done the sort of first uh, uh, set for um, the uh, one, one bay of the windows uh, all the way down the, uh, the five floors, um, and those being built then with uh, new brick reveals and so on. But actually, the main work is not really going into the window opening, but to the pier, which is what takes all the... Uh, alone and there's an intricate sort of sequence which means that it all has to be done in a, in a particular order and it's the bonding done with lime mortar or uh, yes we're actually we're actually we, we're using uh, lime it's, it's um, hydraulic lime and uh, it's the same mortar it needs to be reasonably compatible with the rest of the brickwork so we don't want to kind of introduce anything that's you know going to have markedly different uh, qualities and once the brickwork is intact, you know, the, the point loads mean that, you know, actually normal lime water is, 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 is quite uh, adequate for the task, really. We did have a discussion about that earlier on, but uh, actually, yeah, we are using... Can you, you've had a, presumably you can analyse what the makeup of the original was? Yes, yeah, I mean, the, the original is, is that, you know, as it, as it has to be from that date, it is, it is a lime water. It's quite a... It's quite a um, uh, a really good, you know, quality lime water. It's, it's not a sort of soft, weak one like you'll see on uh, on some buildings. It, it's it's really quite a good product here. So it's uh, we we're matching to that really. Yeah. Um, so that, as you'll be aware, is you know sort of what we're then creating. So um, we're opening up all the windows again and uh, putting in uh, the brickwork. And for phase one, all we're getting is the openings. There will then be some temporary boarding in those openings because we want phase two to be taking responsibility for the whole of the window installation and the completion of that. Um, was that what the, the bottom one, is that what the original window layout was? Or were those little ones? So on the bottom, the, 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 there are some tweakings to this because obviously we, we've kept, we've kept the, um, the maltings windows um, and we've kept, uh, the, these are quite useful, so we're keeping those because those come out onto the, the main sort of terrace on, on the... Um, the east side of the building. Um, there are then some where we sort of had to make a reasonable rhythm of the windows, work with the openings that we've got, and so on. There's been in each one of these, it's been kind of argued over and said, should we do this, should we do that? So that, and m most of them just follow the the outline of the full size window. But there's occasional ones where there's been some later alteration, where it's been tweaked around, and we need then to take a decision about which which date <laughs> we go with. And we've, we've sort of been through that and, uh, and decided... It looks a lot better than the previous version. I mean, the fenestration we were looking at four or five years ago, you had well, to I, close your eyes and say, yeah, get on with it. I believe so. I, 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 that it came from a very different design yeah. philosophy, which I didn't feel... Yeah. Like, you know, 
Uh, I didn't myself, you know, that was my view of this. I'm, I'm much happier with this. But also, my view is always that if you were going to open the windows up, you opened them full size. You know, why would you not, really? And that, that was where I think the previous design philosophy ended up in a sort of rather strange place. Really. <coughs> uh, anyway, um, so um, just to say what's now going on at the moment, you'll see a whole lot of holes being dug in the ground and saying, what's that about? What's that about, unfortunately, is that for this giant propping system that we need to do, temporary propping system to hold the brickwork up while we do the major repairs, we're having to go into the ground uh, to get temporary foundations for that, so a whole lot of holes are being dug. We did quite a lot of investigation of archaeology last year and the ground conditions, and in fact on the, um, the east side uh, there is a hole, uh, as we know, uh, there's, this is the plan, so we're down at this end, that's the main mill. On the east side there with the canal over there, there was uh, in the 1850s a whole array of uh, boiler houses erected which were then replaced with the lean-to shed uh, in the malting space. And uh, what uh, happened actually was that the, the floor level on this is about two metres, six feet or so down below this, which means that what we have now here, we can't just dig down and put a, a, a concrete foundation down there, which is then going to take all this propping. Uh, they're having to put uh, a whole piling system in just for our temporary propping. So this is where quite a lot of the, uh, the costs of the project start uh, getting uh, lost. The piling system that's being used is a, um, uh, a very uh, particular sort, it's called heli pile. It's being put in by Target Structural. Um, I don't know whether they've uh, done it all yet, but they were making good progress. They'd, not more than halfway along uh, last week when I was here. Um, and it uh, has this sort of um, spiral uh, arrangement, um, three uh, tyres going in together in one pocket, and uh, they're driven into the ground. And uh, it's a very uh, sort of <coughs> low impact system. Normally, if you see big uh, city developments, you have either driven paths with great thundering and shaking and hammering, which would not be a good idea here, <laughs> or um, big uh, boring machine uh, doing sort of major reinforced concrete and so on. This is much more of a sort of sensitive solution that can be tailor-made to suit the, the particular ground, so it's someone um, that we've been... Um, well, they stay when the... Yeah. They, they, they stay, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they start to try and take them all out again is an extra yeah, cost, really, so you just leave them in. They, they're not something you can reuse again, so you know, that's it. So that's uh, just, uh, in a nutshell, really, the major part of this contract is really all about the brickwork and the windows and uh, the structure and uh, gets us to that point. Um, the, um, the tie rods uh, and so on will be being done as part of this phase because before we can take the scaffold down, we have to have the tie rods in place to hold the building together. Um, but then the other major part that we're doing, obviously it makes sense within this first phase to do the roof while we've got a temporary roof. We're, we're doing only the section of roof that's under the temporary roof. We wanted to keep this contract really down to the sort of minimum value so that we were still able to get the conservation building market rather than the bigger contractors who don't really have the right sort of attitude for this kind of highly uh, sensitive conservation work. Um, so the other part of it that we're doing is, is the roof, which you're familiar with. Um, so that's the uh, rather unusual roof design. That's um, it's a couple of weeks ago, um, and I would say last week's actually moved on further than this really. So um, the uh, all of the Welsh slates have come off. Um, the boarding, which is largely actually, for instance, from the 1950s and 60s, we haven't got any of the original boarding there, it's, it's now pretty much entirely off, um, and that will be being reboarded, and then new Welsh slates uh, coming in. Um, the original slates, as we've got uh, evidence for on some of the things like the, uh, the, the cross mill, were the older, older style slates laid in diminishing courses with the larger ones at the eaves and, and getting smaller towards the top. Um, so we had a debate about this, in fact most of this is, is now in, in standard size courses but there's some reuse slates with bits of that earlier system. So what we're going to do um, is actually just on these two slides, this is looking at it from uh, the view that you've, you'll be familiar with looking as you go upstairs within the Jubilee Tower. Um, looking out of there. So the first two slopes we're going to do in diminishing courses because we feel it's a nice sort of gesture that this is how it used to be, but actually we're then for the rest of it going to do it in stand because that's what it had become and it's also obviously a lot more economical to do it that way. But they are obviously going to be uh, the genuine Welsh slate from uh, the uh, Penry and Quarries. Um, the other thing that's very much uh, come to the fore um, with this piece of work is they um, 
it's, it's very unusual roof design. Uh, as you know, by the time they got onto the later buildings like the cross mill and the uh, warehouse and so on, they went for normal standard uh, pitched roof with, with trusses like this. This one has the crinkle crinkle roof all the way along, so it has a, a, a large number of these original uh, valley gutters in between. What's come to light in our investigations last year was that these are the original cast iron valley gutters. Um, uh, enormous sort of great pieces of cast iron which have all been detailed in uh, and the sort of uh, the junctions for them made and boltings allow for the way that they connect into the frame all cast in you know that whole building it the the forethought that went into how it all fitted together as you know is very intricate so we're having to uh, work with this um, that goes for the big piece now um, this i just snapped these uh, last week and uh, that afternoon they went off that so these are now, uh, there's a firm called Heritage um, Project Management uh, who are based actually just uh, within a few miles of here uh, and they're specialists in doing work on cast iron so um, they're quite, uh, we're going to be able to go there to their workshops and agree the detail. We, again, we're having to come up with some innovative detail how we retain the maximum of this material but we make it function uh, with some movement joints to it which is why this is neat probably uh, after about... Uh, <laughs> The first 20 years of its life, it's probably been leaking. <coughs> Did you say it was re roofed in the 60s? Yes, yeah, that's the wood and all the um, well. What, what we found is that's what it looks like is that, um, and that went to the extent that they, they took all of these cast iron gutters up and they'd been um, with sort of broken ends, they'd been um, refixed with um, uh, uh, bolts of sort of that kind of era, post war sort of era, and the, the boarding and so on. It looks like um, there was a major program of work. I don't know quite, you know, how that would have been done and paid for, but that's what the building itself is telling us that there was a, a big re roofing program then. Yeah. Presumably it was um, failing after the war and they needed to do something. Um, what that's doing is, is uh, revealing um, uh, in some detail for the first time the top side of, of what happens with the, the cast iron at this level. So you'll be familiar with these kind of big bolted joints where the, uh, the, the members come together. But you know, once again, there's these uh, uh, detailing places for where um, uh, joints to be made. So that's going to be being recorded in some detail, as was the earlier frame by the archaeologists. We've got um, the same team of archaeologists. Um, who've been have been involved with the project for some years? They're now Salford Archaeology rather than um, <coughs> Oxford Archaeology, but we've got the same people, which is what's more important. <laughs> Looks like they could have gone, wanted to go up another floor. Or two. Yes, it's rather odd, isn't it? Really, um, and uh, the way the uh, timber fits. This um, is going down towards the, and they've actually got. Uh, this is a timber plate. As it goes down, they sort of want need a tempering timber plate, and these um, bolts are actually, you know. The original fixings going into the original cast in sockets in the, in the 1797 beams, so it's um, interesting to see how that was done. And um, just finally, that's sort of all the work on the constructional detail, really just to uh, say a little bit about the arrangements on site and access and so on. Obviously, it's now very different from what it was. Now, on the other side of the fence is the contractor's site area, it's their working area, they need to get on with their job, it's, uh, there isn't generally access to that. It's a major contract and you know they really are under time pressure to, to get things done so they need to be able to focus on their work. What we've devised and we've talked this through with, um, with, with, with uh, Alan and, and Richard in, in, uh, before we uh, went out to tender is, is then a division of, of, uh, of the area so that, as you can see out there, things are fenced off and on, the, on your side uh, you've got the car park down here, you've got the office and stables, you've got the dye house. Uh, we've retained for you this uh, access uh, through past here and up to that sort of viewing area where there's the, uh, the big signs and so on. So you can see that what we've had to do is to exclude you from coming down in front of the main mill because we've got major site operations now which we can't afford to disrupt. Um, and instead of, as has been the case really before, that the contractors were coming in this way, particularly when they were working with this, there's now all of their contractors' access is now coming in here. So they've set up site compound over here. They've got some more site compound stuff over here. So the, we've been basically setting it up so that there's a public and friends area and there's a contractors' area, and hopefully uh, the interface between those is very clear and uh, you, you can do your own thing in your own area without sort of uh, <coughs> causing difficulties. So, oh, Nick, thanks very much. We all yeah, appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. And, um, Mm -hmm. We'll show sure.